Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Gitim, Gitim Daf Zayin. Today's stuff is sponsored by Malka Abraham in honor of her 66th birthday. Thank you, Rabbi Michelle, and the Hadron community for all that you do. Zalto. We're going to get started just to remind us what we got up to and why we got off on this tangent. We had Rabbi Eviatar who sent a letter to Rav Chista. And in the letter he said, we were talking about Babylonia and what the status of Babylonia is regarding this. Is it like Israel? It doesn't need, you don't need to say it. Or is it like Chutzlaretz? And particularly if you're bringing the get from Babylonia to Israel, do you have to say And Rabbi Eviatar said, you do not. And then we started raising questions. Rabbi Yosef said, do we really trust Rabbi Eviatar? Is he a trustworthy person? What about this? the fact that he wrote a letter and didn't do the sirtut. He didn't write the lines, put in the lines when writing psukim of psukim from the Tanakh. So then we said, that's not such a big deal, right? And we, right. So first of all, somebody, Abaye said, first of all, it's just Rabbi Yitzchak who said that. And it's just a tradition. And it's very likely he just didn't have that tradition. It's not something you would get to by logic, even though theoretically you could say it's kind of logical because the whole idea is you want to write the psukim in a way that looks respectable. And it doesn't look respectable if there's no lines and looks kind of messy. But still the Gemara claims that this is something, or at least Abayi claims, this is something that's based on tradition and not based on logic. That's the first thing. Then he furthermore says, and not only that, but God agreed with Eviat, Rabbi Eviatar when it came to his parshanut, his way of explaining the pasuk about Pilegesh Begiva. And that's how we got off on this big tangent about Pilegesh Begiva and the whole story. And the last thing we learned about the story because we have the story where Eliyahu comes and he says to Rabbi Aviatar, oh, you know, God agrees with you. And this, well, what's God doing in Shemayim? And he said, oh, he's discussing your Parshanut. And even though, again, God seemed to say, well, the real Parshanut was Rabbi Yonatan, but he also agreed with his Parshanut. And with that came the famous statement of Elu Elu Dibre Elu Hibchayim, right? They're all part of the living Torah. Um, okay, now... From there, we got into this other things we can learn from the story of Pilegish Begiba. They shouldn't make people too fearful of you in your house. They okay? shouldn't be this kind of tyrant in your house. And basically, because that's what happened with this guy who was married to the Pilegish, she was very scared of him when either there was a bee in the food or a hair, either in the food or in her body. And she ran away from him. And from that whole story where she runs away and then he tries to bring her back, that's how eventually it led to a civil war and many people getting killed. The last thing we saw was Rabbi Barachana, who says that this Mishnah about things you should say in the house before Shabbat, basically kind of ask your wife, did you do the Trumot Maslot? Did you take the tithes? Did you put up an Eruv? And if so, time to light the candle. Well, you should say it nicely, okay? In order that she'll listen to you. Amar of Ashi, starting now from line two of our death, I didn't hear this. And this is why I wanted to remind you of that tradition versus logic. He said, I never heard that he said this. I didn't receive a tradition about the importance of saying this nicely. But but I, I do it anyway, because it's just obvious, right? Anyone who knows anything about interpersonal relations knows that this is the obvious way to do things. Now continuing along this idea of don't make other people scared of you in the house. Don't be this tyrant in your own house where people are so fearful of you because it could lead to blank. So we're going to see that right now. Don't make people terrified of you. There was a very prominent person who did this. And they fed him non-kosher food. Okay, another terrible thing that could come out of doing this. Omanu, who was this? And then we'll get the story, although they don't really tell you the full story, but we'll kind of figure it out from the details. Rabbi Hanina ben Gamliel. So Rabbi Hanina ben Gamliel, he was a tyrant in his house, scared all of his workers and, and people who lived in his household. And as a result, they fed him non-kosher food, to which the Gemara asks, you really think they fed him non-kosher food? How do we know that no way, no how did they feed him non-kosher food? Because of a very famous story. When it comes to the animals of Sadiqim, God of righteous people, God doesn't let any terrible thing happen to them. No sin is going to befall them. 
צדיקים עצמם מקור שכן, so the righteous people themselves, and Rabbi Hanin ben Gamliel was one of them. Of course, God wouldn't allow this to happen. And yes, Miriam, thanks for remembering. Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair's donkey, if you remember the story, where he wouldn't eat the food, and then it became clear after that the food was demai, it was food that wasn't clear that the food had been tied, and that's why the donkey wasn't interested in eating the food. It was because God makes sure that the animal of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair wasn't going to eat food that wasn't Okay, so from there we learn for sure God would never have let such a mistake happen. Ella, it must be bikshula hachilo davar gadol. It must be they wanted to feed him non-kosher food, but my, and, but it didn't happen. Okay, he figured it out, I guess, or, or somehow it was stopped. We don't know how. But my nihu, what was it? Ever minachad. It was a limb from a live animal. Now, why would they have used a limb from a live animal? So the commentaries say what must have happened was. They fed him, um, Rashi explains this, that they, they lost a bone from the animal. They lost a limb. So they were about to feed him this animal and part of it was missing. So what they do, they were in a rush and they basically just cut off the limb of the live animal and tried to feed it to him, you know, put it on the plate as if it was kosher food, okay? And it wasn't. Again, we don't know exactly how he didn't end up eating it, but somehow he was protected. Shalach lemer ukbalu now we're going to have all sorts of letters that were written because remember Rabbi Aviatar we got to in one tangent we got off on was the Pelagish Begiva story. And from there we got to, you shouldn't put fear, excessive fear into people in your household. Now we're going to shift off into a different issue about Rabbi, um, about um, one thing, Rabbi Aviatar because we want to talk now about sirtut, about the fact that we make lines on the paper. We're not really going to talk about it. We're actually going to talk about totally other topics, but they're going to be things that people wrote in letters one to the other, question, and they got an answer from a verse in the, in the Tanakh, and they wrote sirtut on the, on the cloth, on the parchment. They made lines on it in the story and wrote the, you know, an answer back. So because of this retreat, we're going to get into this and we're going to get off on all sorts of different topics. And in fact, part of it is going to connect to the very end of Masechet Sotah. There's always nice, oftentimes the end of Masechet Sotah connect with the beginning of the other Masechet Sotah. We didn't see as many direct connections that we often see, but here we're going to see a connection. So a lot of our stories are going to be actually with the Resh Galuta. In this case, it's Mar Ufa. He's the head of the Galut. Okay, it was like a like a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a more political type of head. He was the head of the Galut, and he was always someone from the house of David, okay? It was like a semi, also kind of religious, but more like a political leader. So Marukva, although sometimes they were Tamidei Chachamim as well, Marukva sends to Rabbi Elazar. In this case, he's sending the question. In another case, he's going to be answering the question. So he sends the following question. B'nei Adam ha'umdim alai. There's people who are really... Uh, uh, thorn in my side. They're causing me lots of problems, which often happens when you're a ruler of, a, of an area. You know, people cause you all sorts of issues. And if I want to, I could really just turn them over to the authorities, right? Whether it's the Roman or whatever authorities, I could turn them over. Mahu, should I? And we're talking about Jewish people. And in fact, we're going to see even they were Tamidei Chachamim, or at least one of them that was going to come up in the story is a Tamid Chacham. Sirtet v'katavla. So Rabbi Elazar, sirtet, he draws lines and he writes. Now, why is he drawing lines and Marukva didn't? Because Marukva wasn't writing a pasuk. He was just writing a letter, a regular letter. You don't need sirtut. It's only when you're going to have a pasuk from the Tanakh. So he writes in the following pasuk. He quotes a pasuk from Tehilim, Psalms. Amarti eshmerad derchaim echato belishoni. I said I'm going to protect my mouth from sinning. Eshmerad lepi machsom be'od rasha l'negdi. I'm going to keep my mouth sealed shut when the wicked person is in front of me. Thank you, Gita, for pointing out it's probably Persian, which is true. The reason I have um, Roman in my head is because they're going to put him in a kolar. And usually the kolar was, was something the Romans used, but it could be the Persians used it as well. Um, okay, but you're probably right. So now we say the following. What does this pasuk mean? Af What does it mean? When there's a wicked person in front of me, even though there's a wicked person in front of me, I'm going to keep my mouth sealed. Meaning, don't do anything. This is not your business to get involved. Be silent. 
Shalach lay. Well, Marukva wasn't so happy with this. He said, listen, they're really, really getting at me. And I, and I can't stop them. I can't stand up against them. I, they're much more powerful than I am. Shalach lay. So he sends him another pasuk from Tilling. Dom la Hashem So what are, what's the connection between Dom la Hashem, be silent to God, lo. Let's understand how they understand hitcholel. Dom la Hashem, be silent to God. Vehu yapilem lecha chalalim chalalim. The word hitcholal has the root halal. Halal is a dead body. God will drop them body by body. Okay, God will take care of it for you. So what should you do? You make sure that you go early to the Beit Midrash and you stay late in the Beit Midrash. Okay, you make sure that you get there before them and you stay there after them. Here's where we see that they were Tamidei Chachamim as well. But you be there first and you stay there last and you'll see they're just going to disappear. Okay, they're going to get killed on their own. As Rabbi Elazar said it, and Geneva gets put in this kolar, which is some way that the Romans used to kill the people. Again, it could be it was used by other nations as well, and it could be it was the Persians here, but he basically gets killed by the other nation. Okay, so now, who is Geneva? You might remember Geneva. Geneva is a character that's, again, he's a big tabi chacham, but he's very controversial and he gets into a lot of fights with people. And it makes sense in the context here that he was bothering Marukva. He was a very... It was a very controversial kind of character. And here he gets what he deserves, but by God, not by Marukva. Shalchule the Marukva. Different question now. As, and soon we're going to get back to this idea. It's, it's a little bit out of order. We're going to come back to this idea about being silent and having God take care of your enemies, but that's going to come soon. So now we're moving to a different question. And in this case, they ask Marukva the following question. Zimra minalan asya. How do we know it's forbidden to sing? And for those who learned Sota will remember that this was at the very end of Masak Sota, that in the wake of the destruction, they forbade singing and live music and all of that in order to remember the destruction. We talked about it. It's not so clear how people do it nowadays based on this, this, you know, it seems kind of clear that this is actually all forbidden. So Zimra Manalanda Asir, Sertek Bekatavlehu. So he again, Marukva this time writes in the Sirtut, he makes, him la- makes the lines, and he writes back, Al Yismach Yisrael El Gil Ba'ami, Al Tismach Yisrael, sorry. To the Jews should not be, the Israelites should not be happy with the Gil, the singing of the other nations. To which they ask, or the Gemara asks, why didn't he bring a different pasuk? And it's the pasuk we saw when we were learning in Sota, which is, B'shir lo yishtu yayin yemar shechar l'shotah. Right? While you're si- while you're drinking wine, you shouldn't be singing. So that would be a better pasuk. To which they say, "Ima who if you use the second pasuk, have amina hanimila zimmer demani." You might have thought it only means singing with musical instruments. Now there's no musical instruments in that pasuk, but if you look at the pasuk before, there's mention of musical instruments. So because of that, this is a good example of where looking at one pasuk without seeing the context. Right when you're really learning gemara properly and not dafyomi, you should always open the Tanakh and see the pasukim around it because often when they quote pasukim. It's connected to not only that verse, but the verses around it. How about the Puma Shari? But you would have thought that to sing without musical accompaniment perhaps would be permitted. Therefore, this comes to teach you, no, it is not. And that's why they use the other pasuk, which is just general singing. Now we're going to get back to this issue of being silent. And we're looking at a, a bunch of pasukim in, or a bunch of cities that are mentioned in Sefer Yeshua about the conquering and what whose nachalat belongs to. And we're going to see, and the truth is, it's unclear why they're darshaning specifically these, these cities. But some people claim that it's there's a problem in the psukim. It says there's 29 cities, and then it lists 35. So they assume there the extra six must be used for drasha purposes. And they're going to darshan six of the cities. We're going to start with three. So we, Rav Huna asked, um, Huna Barnatan asked Ravashi, my dichtiv. Now we're not in letters at this point. We're not writing letters, right? We're going to get back to the letters. But right now we had one letter about being silent, right? When your enemies are up against you. And the second was, how do we know singing is forbidden? So now we're going back to the first on a tangent off of that. Why does it say kina v'dimona v'ad adam? So Amarle says to him, what do you mean? They're listing the cities of Israel. Why, why are you asking this question? It's a silly question. 
Of course, they're saying Kina, Dimona, and Adada, right? We even know Dimona, right? It's a city. These are just cities. They're listing them. You think I don't know that these are cities of Israel? Of course, I know they're cities of Israel. That wasn't what I was asking. He says, Ravia from Argiza gave it darshan, the, the meaning of these cities. They learn not kina without an aleph, but it's like kina with an aleph, which is jealousy. If someone is jealous of his friend, which also could be anger or has some issue with him, vidomem, dimona from the lashon of domem. These are it's a little bit of poetic license here um, to turn dimona to domem, but is silent. Shochen ad, shochen ade ad, the one who lives forever, which is ad ada, ade ad, is a drash on there, which is God, oselodi. God will bring him judgment. So the same idea we saw before. So our Malay says back to him, alamayata, tsiklag uman mana vesansana hakinami. What you want to say, these other three are also, and this is why we get to the six, these other three also, you have something to say about them? Amarle, he says, well, Says, look, I don't know how to darshan them, but if Rav Gvia, who was really good at this, he was here, he'd be able to say something about this. But he's not here, so we don't have his drasha. But in any case, Rav Acha mebe koza amar bahafi. Somebody else gave a drasha on this. Komi sheyeshlo sa'akat ligima. Siklag is short for sa'akat ligima, which again is a cry about someone's bad behavior. Al chavero, on his friend. Vidomem, again, madmena domem, and is silent. Now we have sansena. What's in the word sansena? Sne. The sne was the burning bush, right? So shochem the sne, the one who dwelled in the bush, in the burning bush, oselodin. He will make, he will pass judgment on this person. So again, both these six cities, basically, those three and those three each tell the same message that we saw earlier. Yeah, the order of the Gemara is a little bit confusing why they didn't bring it up then, but leave it at that. The third scene we have now is the Reish Galuta again. Okay, we have another, this time it's not Ukwa, it's just some random Reish Galuta, we don't know who. Says to Rav Huna, this is really going to be a tangent off on the singing, okay, because we're not in the letter anymore, we're talking again, but the Reish Galuta says to Rav Huna, Kalila Manala and Asr. How do we know that the crown of the grooms are forbidden? Amarle, Midrabanan. So Rav Huna says to him, it's a rabbinic decree, we don't have a pasuk for it, it's a rabbinic decree. Ditznan, how do I know it's rabbinic? Because it says in the Mishnah at the end of Masechet Sota, Bipul shal aspasyanus, that was, remember, leading up to the destruction, Gazru ala tarot chatanim v'ala iwus. They said no more crowns of, bra- of grooms, and also these musical, this particular musical instrument that was sort of a type of drum slash tambourine, something like that, were forbidden. Adahachi kam rafuna li pnuyeh. Rafuna gets up to go to the bathroom, okay? So we have this scene. Reish Galut to ask Rafuna the question, how do we know that using these crowns of, of chatanim is forbidden? He seemed to be looking for a pasuk. Rav Huna says, don't look for a pasuk. It's forbidden by rabbinic law. There's no verse in the Torah for it. So when Rav Huna gets up to go to the bathroom and he's no longer there, apparently Rav Chista didn't want to say anything while Rav Huna was there, Rav Chista pipes in. You want a pasuk? I got a pasuk for you. Hashem Elohim Haser HaMitznefet Baharem HaAtara Take off your turban and take off, pick up your atara, your crown. Zot lo zot. Okay, we're going to have to explain what this means. This, not this. Hashvala hagbe. You're going to bring down the, you're going to, sorry, you're going to, the, the low people are going to be lifted up. Vahagavo hashpil. And the high people are going to be brought down. So now they want to know. mitznefet etzal atara. What does the mitznefet have to do with the atara? What's the mitznefet? The mitznefet is the turban that the Kohen Gadol wore. It's one of the, the clothing of the Kohen Gadol. El anomar lecha. Bizman she mitznefet berosh Kohen Gadol, atara berosh kol adam. When the mitznefet's on the Kohen Gadol, then the atara can be on everybody else. In other words, the Kohen Gadol has this mitznefet and it's compared in this pasuk to the crowns. So that's fine. But nistal kan mitznefet berosh Kohen Gadol, but when the destruction of the temple happens and the Kohen Gadol is no longer wearing the mitznefet, his turban. So here you have, right, we're going to have to take off the atarot of all the people, meaning grooms can no longer wear their crowns. So this is why we have, this is where we see in a pasuk 
a, a reference, an allusion to the fact that they're going to be forbidden in the time of the destruction. In the meantime, Rapuna gets back from the bathroom. He sees that they're sitting together talking. He says, listen, I promise you, I swear in the name of God, this is rabbinic, this or this decree. But but is your name and your words are chesed. Your words are beautiful. And you came up with a beautiful pasuk to connect it. Don't forget that this is only rabbinic, but I'm impressed with the fact that you came up with a pasuk. So he wasn't upset with him, right? You would have thought he went to the bathroom and then Rav Chisda gets up and it seems disrespectful, but he actually was impressed with him. Ravina Eshkeche Lamar Barabashi. We haven't finished with this pasuk, by the way. We're going to get back to it and actually connect it to Shavuot, which is very nice having Shavuot this week. So Ravina finds Mar Barabashi, Davagadil Kalila Labarthi. He sees he's making a crown for his daughter. Amarle, Lo Savar Lamal, Haser Mitznefe Barema Tara. Don't you have this pasuk? That when the mitznefet is no longer on the Kohen Gadol, you're not allowed to put the crowns. So why are you making a crown for your daughter? Amar lei, dumiyat the Kohen Gadol. Big gavre, aval benashe lo. This is only for men. It's only like the Kohen Gadol. The atara talked about in this pasuk is, as we said before, it's for the grooms, not for the brides. The brides are allowed to wear their crowns. The grooms are not. Okay, this might explain why brides often have some sort of a crown on their head. Uh, so, uh, you know, besides the veil, there's usually like a headpiece. And grooms do not, okay? You might've thought, oh, it's not really, right? It'd be weird that grooms would wear something on their head. It's only weird because we don't have this, right? But apparently at some point they did have, and grooms used to wear also some sort of crown on their head. Okay, I don't know if the reason we don't do it today is because of this, but you see here the difference and, you know, the distinction. My zot lo zot. So now we get back to what is this zot lo zot, which is strange language. And what does it even mean? This, not this. Darash ravavira. So Rav Avira Darchins, and sometimes he said it, I learned this from Rabbi Rav Ami, sometimes he said I learned it from Rav Ass. At the moment when God said, you're going to basically, the destruction is coming, right? This is a passage, by the way, it's Yechezka. And it's basically saying, you know, bad things are on their way. So the Malachim come up to support the Jews and they say, what's going on here? Master of the world. This is what, okay, the first this, Zot. This is what you're doing to the Jews? The Jewish people, they're your nation. How could you possibly destroy them? These are the people that said, said we're going to do before they even heard the Torah. They said, said before Nishma. How could you possibly do this to them? Amar lahem, lo zot. God says back to them, this is not that, okay? Lo zot lahem li Yisrael, sheshpilu et ha-gavoa v'yigbilu et ha-shafel v'yamidu tzalem e'chal. What are we saying here? This is not, I'm not doing that to the Jews because this is not the same kind of Jews. These Jews flipped everything. They brought the low people high. They brought the high people low, right? This is all going back to the description at the end of Masechet Sota, really connecting these two Masechetot right, about all the bad things that happened and the corruption that was going on. And they even went so far as to put in uh, an idol in the Hechal, in the temple, right, in the sanctified area of the temple. And because of that, the destruction is coming to them. They basically broke the covenant. Okay, if you want to hear more about this, this Nasev and Ishmaz versus this, on Second Thought This Week of Rabbani Ifi Climbers about this, it should be up later this morning on the site and you can listen. Darish Rav Avira. So now, again, another drasha of Rav Avira, where sometimes he said in the name of Rav Ami, sometimes in the name of Rav Asi. My dikti, we're going to darshan another pasuk. And now we're going to get off on a different topic, okay? We're here now, again, we're tangenting off. Let's just review what we did. We started with, we finished the Pilegish Begibah story. We went to the Sirtut things, where we had two letters that were Sirtut. One was about the people who were, giving you problems, you should be silent. And from there, we got off on some tangents about other things about that, other psukim that show that idea. Then we had this issue of not being able to sing. And from there, we got into not being able to wear crowns. The, the, the grooms can't wear crowns. And that's where we got into our topic now. And then we finished darshaning that pasuk that we quoted that shows it was the kind of allusion in the Tanakh to the fact that you can't wear crowns, even though it was really rabbinic.
So from there, we're getting off on a totally different topic, which has to do with the importance of charity. But we're here because Rav Avira, it was a drasha of Rav Avira that sometimes said in the name of Rav Asi, sometimes in the name of Rav Am. What does the Pasuk mean? This is a Pasuk from Nahum, which is one of the Trasar, the 12 small books. This is what God said. Now, what God is saying, this is a prophecy against the Gentile nations that have been oppressing us. And God promises us, if they're whole or many, we'll explain what that means in a minute, according to the drasha. I will cut them and they will pass. And then the continuation is, and I will not make you suffer anymore or be tortured anymore. So it's a positive prophecy about what will happen to the Jewish people. But we're going to learn this to something totally different. Means if you're complete, meaning you have exactly what you need. So I need X amount of money to make it through the month. And that's exactly the amount of money that I have. Well, give some to charity anyway. That's im shlemim v'chem nagozu. What is nagozu? Cut. Cut some and give it to charity. Well, it's right. And all the more so if you have extra money. Okay, so if you have even just the exact amount of money that you need to survive, you still have to give money to charity. And of course, all the more so if you have extra money. What do we darshan from these words? If you cut from your money and give tzedakah, what is va'aval? You'll be saved from hell. Avar means you'll pass, right? You'll pass through and you won't have problems. There's a, there's a parable here to be told of two sheep that are going through the water. They use the vayagos for the parable. One, they sheared the wool, and the other one, they hadn't sheared the wool. What's going to happen now? The one who sheared is going to get through because he's very light. The one, the one who's very full of a lot of wool is going to drown in the water because the water is going to get into the wool. It's going to make the sheep very heavy, and the sheep will drown. This is, by the way, and we're going to see a few other statements of this sort, is saying you should give charity because it's better for you. It's better for you, not just that it's better for the person who receives the charity, but it's better for you because you're weighed down by your wealth. Sometimes it weighs people down, right? The way they say, the more money you have, the more possessions you have, the more worries you have. And while people think it's good to have wealth and it makes less worry because people who don't have money worry where they're buying food the next day, and you think it's a good thing to have wealth, on the other hand, it could also weigh you down. So there's pros and cons to both sides, right? But they're saying it's good to give charity because it lightens you and it's, it's healthy for you. Now moving to Amu Bet. Ve'initicha, okay, even though it's really va'anotcha, okay, or ini, I guess, oh, you know what? It is aninotecha. Okay, I'm not sure how it's written in the pasuk, but ve'initicha. So now we have to darsh on this word. Now we understood this word at the end of the pasuk. Ve'anotcha lo en cha'od. You will no longer be tortured, okay? From the Lashon of Inoy, like we see with Yom Kippur, or Vavdu V'inuotan, when it comes to the Brit Ben Abtarim, they'll be tortured. But now, you can see where they're going with this, Initicha, from the language of Ani, poor, poverty. So, Amar Marzutcha, Afilu Ani, Hamit Parnes Minat Staka, Yaset Staka. So, in the beginning of the Pasuk, we have, um, we start with, Shlemim, if you have exactly the right amount of money, you have to give charity. Then we said, V'chein Rabin, you have more money than what you need. Then we go to, even if you're poor, as the passage continues, it says, even if you don't have enough money, you still have to give charity. Lo en cha'od, and what's the promise? You will not be poor anymore. Amar Rav Yosef, Tanei Rav Yosef, he brought a bright to, to say this, Shuv en mar'im lo simanani And this someone quoted before, Aser v'chdesh etitasher, right? Aser ta'aser, is a share kadesh tit asher, right? Take your masro so that you get wealthy. Same thing here. It's the same idea, just from a different pasuk. If you're poor and you give charity, God will basically protect you that you won't be poor anymore. So here we see the importance of charity. And again, here we see it'll be good for you, right? Even though we look, we usually view charity as something you're doing for other people, this is basically showing how charity is also good for yourself as well. 
Rabbi, right? Either because it's going to help you, right? The, the poor person, well, God will promise he'll give you money. And with the wealthy person, it's not because you'll get rewarded from God, but it's more that it's weighing you down and it's better for you actually to give charity. That was the end of this section. So basically we ended up with two situations where people wrote a letter and did surtout. But from those two places, we got off on these tangents about, we got you know more into this idea of people torturing you, you should be silent. We brought all sorts of proofs. We got, we took the topic of not singing and we took it into also, what about not wearing crowns? And we had questions, where do we get that from? Really, it shouldn't be from a pasuk, but in the end, they find a pasuk. And then we get to a drasha, because we were at this drasha of Ravavira on that pasuk that we quoted for the pasuk about the crowns. From there, we got to a different drasha of Ravavira and we got into charity. Okay, now we're going to go back to our Mishnah. So that was a, a summary of the beginning part of the daf. Now we're going to have two more sections. The first section is on Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Mirechem Lamizrach. If you remember, Rabbi Yehuda delineated the boundaries in the Mishnah. And one of the boundaries he talked about was Akko is the northern boundary. Akko is the border on the north. And Akko, if you remember, he says, is like outside of Israel. And right, so that's the northern border. And anything south of that, right, is going to be part of Israel. And then there was a debate whether Akko is like Israel or not like Israel. But it's clear, the Memra, the Akko that's found there is Israel kind of. Right? Are you trying to say, and it seems like the mission is basically very clear about this, that Akko is the northern border. But we have a problem from a mission in Olot, Uraminu. Okay, we're now talking, the mission in Olot is all about Chuma and Tahara. That's why it's Ohel, purity and impurity laws. You might remember that the rabbis decreed that all land outside of Israel is impure. So now the question is, again, where are the borders to say this is impure, this is pure? So if you're outside of Israel, you're automatically become impure. You're considered impure on a rabbinic level. So it says here, Hayama halech me ako And you're going to see from the des description, Ako, you're going north to Ksiv. Okay, now we know Ksiv, if you know the map of Israel, Ksiv is north of Ako. They didn't exactly know that. They didn't have maps. Okay, you can even see there's these diagrams. You have a real Gemara in front of you. Rashi has diagrams in the Rashi here. Okay, I didn't check. I don't know. And these diagrams appear in Rashi, whether they're Rashi or whether there's some older, you know, after the time of Rashi, but some from the printer tried to print things that, you know, diagrams that match Rashi. I don't recall if it's Rashi himself made some sort of diagram or it's someone later, either which way it's from a while ago. But they try to draw these out, sketch them out so that you have a sense of the way the map looks. Okay. In mine, anyway, it's weird because Safon is not at the top. Safon is on the, the right, right? You would think they would have put Safon at the top. So now you're walking from Akko to Ksiv and you're walking up north to the right on the east side. That's how you know that you're walking north because they're telling you on the right is east. Okay. So if to the right is east, then when you're walking from there to there and the right is east, then, then walking from there to there is north. Out to the east. So from Akko to the east is considered impure. It's Gentile territory. And therefore, not only that, but laws of all things that are the Shemitah and tithes are not relevant. Unless you know for sure that this place is considered part of the territory of Israel. To the left, to the west, which there is not much there. It's basically on the water, but there must be like a small strip there. But from Akko to Ksiv to the west is considered pure. Okay? Um, it's not considered outside of Israel. And therefore also with tithes and Shemitah, you're liable, right? You're obligated. So now, first of all, there's commentaries who say it's actually the opposite. Okay? And that it really means it makes more sense because to the east of Akko, we know is all this land that was really part of Israel. So hard to say that that wasn't part of Israel. That's the Galilee. And that must have been part of Israel. And maybe what they meant was there was a strip to the left, very close to the water that was considered outside of Israel. So some people say it's the opposite version. And, and Ksiv, yes, is Achziv. Okay, it is Achziv, um, which seems to be that's what they're referring to. Ad Hechan, until what point in the north are we saying this is Israel? Ad Ksiv. Rabbi Yishmael, Rabbi Yossi, Omer Mishum Aviv, Alav Lava, which is actually much further north, which is in, they claim this is in Lebanon of today. 
So what do you see here? That there's this area where the northern border is clearly not Akko, okay? Because it goes all the way north to Ksiv is what they're talking about. So I'm Rabbiye Ritsuana. Abaye says, really Akko was the northern border, but there was a little strip of land that went up to Ksiv and that was considered Israel, but it's not, but really Akko is the northern border. This is a little strip to which the Gemara says, the Yaiv Tana Simana Hachi. Wait a minute. You're saying that this whole thing that the mission all it was talking about was a little strip of land? Would a Mishnah go so far as to talk about a little strip of land? Wouldn't they just talk about things more generally? Why would they be paying attention to some little strip of land? To which the Gemara says, what do you mean? In, of course they would. In fact, the Psukim also talk about little strips, okay? Like a little road. How do we know this? Or a big road, but not a very wide one, okay? How do we know this? And they're, they're, therefore, we're going to basically prove again from Akko to Ksiv that we're talking about was part of Israel. It was a narrow strip. And it wasn't so, you know, it, it's not so significant. That's why our Mishnah kind of just said Akko is the northern border, even though there really is this narrow strip. Why the Mishnah Ola went so far to talk about this little strip? Well, you see it in Psukim as well. What Psukim? Back to the end of Shoftim. The story of Pilagish Pegiva. At the end, it says, Ru, Hine Chag Hashem Bishilom Yamim Yamima. If you remember, they make this big celebration in the end. They want to get people to marry the women of Binyamin because they made this whole thing against Binyamin. I'm not going to get into the details, but they do this Chag in Shiloh every year. Now, where is Shiloh? Hashem Mitzvona Lebeit El. They're going to describe exactly where Shiloh is found again. This is without maps. They're struggling to figure out how this all works. So they're defining this. It's north of Beit El. There's a misila, there's a path that goes, a, a road that goes from Beit El to Shechem. And this is Mizracha Hashemesh. This is on the eastern side of that path. So it's north of Beit El, on the eastern side of this path that goes from Beit El to Shechem. Uminegev Levona, and south of Levona. So we have Levona, then we have the, um, Shiloh is south of it. There's a road to the east, and that road goes from Shechem to Beit El, and this is to the east of that road. So now they say, Papa Misila. What does it mean, Lemizracha Misila? Uh, Mizracha Shemesh Lemisila. He's saying it's to the east of some road, and therefore, what do you see here? Forget about the Tana and a Mishnah. Even Psukim make reference to some sort of small road, and they're just using it to define, you know, where things are. So it's not so crazy that the that the Mishnah would do. So what we did was we brought a Mishnah that seems to contradict our Mishnah and we resolved the problem in terms of is Akko the northern border or not? It actually is other than this one little strip that goes up to Ksiv. Now we're going to bring a question about a boat. What if you're on a boat in the waters in Israel or maybe even the waters? It's a, it's a good question. Do they mean waters outside of Israel like the Mediterranean, but near Israel, right? You think about all the fights over the oil and the water, right? And what belongs to us, what belongs to Lebanon, these recent... Um, negotiations that were going on. So the question is, what if you write the get on the boat? Are you considered in Israel or are you considered outside of Israel? So big question. And maybe they mean actually, if you're in the water, because we're going to see the discussion really becomes if you're in the water within Israel, but you're not on the ground really because you're in the water. So is it considered like you're on the ground of Israel or not? So Tanachada, one writer says, Hamibi get bisfina. Can we be Eretz Israel? If you're bringing a get in a boat, obviously we don't mean that you came from abroad, put it in a boat. That's what we're not talking about because probably most, right, a lot of gets anyway, some of them came in boats. But the point is you wrote the get on the boat. So where are you considered? Are you considered in Israel or are you not considered in Israel because you're above the land? So according to the first Tana, it's like you're bringing in Israel, and then you don't have to say, but a different writer says, it's like you're bringing it from outside of Israel. So Amar of Yirmiya Lokashi. Yirmiya says, don't worry, these aren't contradictory. I mean, they might be contradictory, right? But don't worry about it. Because they each reflect different opinions of Tanaim. Now, we're going to go to a Machlok Tanaim about a different issue, but we're going to say it's the same issue. It's not. As it says in the Mishnah, and we're in a Mishnah in Masechet Chala, and we're trying to talk about afar chutz la'aretz, haba b'sfina la'aretz, if you have soil from abroad, but you bring it in a boat, and it's now in the territory of Israel in the boat, is it chayav b'ma'aseru b'shvi'it? 
but it hasn't gone onto land yet, right? But we're in the boat, which is on top of land, and you're above Eretz Israel. So the question is, is this considered that you're in Israel and you're therefore liable to tithe or not? Or is it relevant for Shemitah? I'm a Rabbi Yehuda. So according to Tanakama, it's like you're in Israel. You're above the land in Israel. I'm a Rabbi Yehuda in Matai. When is this? It's only when you're in very shallow waters and then you're considered attached to the ground because you're so close, right? You're, let's say, well, usually Gosheshet means you're less than 10 Tfachim, 10 hand breaths. That's always the, right? If you remember from Eruvin, it's a big number, 10 Tfachim high or in Shabbat in terms of Rishuyot. If you're less than 10 Tfachim from the ground, you're basically considered close to the ground and it's like you're on the ground. But in a Svina Gosheshet Patur, but if it's not, then you're exempt. So the one that says that we treat you like Chutzlar, it says Rabbi Yehuda, who says, right, assuming we're talking about deep waters, probably we are. So basically, it's like you're in Chutzlar. But Tanakama says, the rabbis say, no, it's like you're in Israel, even if you're Haya. That's one resolution. You could say in a different way. You could say they're both Rabbi Yehuda, but the reality is different. Not that these reflect different opinions in a debate. But it's just a matter, are we in low, shallow waters or are we in deep waters? If you're in shallow waters, then you're like you're in Israel. If you're in deep waters, it's like you're abroad. And then we can explain that there's no machloket here. It's just a difference that each bright is discussing a different reality. I'm a Rebbe Zera. Now we're going to bring a different issue and we'll just start this today and finish it up tomorrow. If you have Generally, if you have a plant with a hole in the bottom, right, often you have that, and it's in the ground, so it's considered attached to the ground, and all the laws of Shemitah and all that are going to apply on a Torah level. If you have it without a hole, then it's not getting nourishment from the ground, and at least on a Torah level, it's not considered like all the laws of Mitzvah Aretz are not relevant. But what if you have holes in the bottom of the, of the planter, but it's on stilts okay and it's very high up and it's not attached to the ground so he says if you would have this kind of a situation you'd be in the exact same debate as the rabbis and rabbi yuda rabbi yuda who says only if it's shallow waters is it considered attached to the ground would say here it's on these stilts it's obviously not connected to the ground and you're not going to have all those laws apply and the rabbis who say if you're in the water you're considered as if you're on the ground. So obviously, if you're on these stilts, say obviously we're going to raise a question, maybe not. But obviously, if you're on the stilts, we're going to assume, since it has the hole in it, that it is somehow getting nourishment for the ground or at least considered attached to the ground and all the laws will apply for the you know la laws of the land that has to do with land in Israel. So I'm a rabbi, but now we're going to say possibly not, and we'll only start this today. We'll continue tomorrow. Dilmalohi, it could be it's not actually the same machlokin. When Rabbi Yehuda says a boat is not considered like the land of Israel is because a boat by nature, it floats. And the boat basically could easily float away from Israel. Okay? It's moving all the time. So it's not really considered connected to the ground. But this plant that's basically on stilts, but it's on top of the, the, the ground of Israel and it's not moving anywhere. Maybe you would, maybe Rabbi Yehuda would consider that part of the land of Israel and would be liable, uh, would be responsible for all those mitzvot. Okay, and then we're going to see that maybe the rabbis only say it in a boat and not here, and we'll get to that tomorrow. So again, the review of the daf, the beginning part I already reviewed about all the things from Pilei Gishbegiva from there on to all these sirtut because of Rabbi Yaviachar that didn't do sirtut. We saw two letters that had sirtut, and from there we got up onto all these topics of we've discussed your enemies and how to deal with them your or how not to deal with them and let God deal with it. Things that are forbidden because of the destruction and the importance of charity. All different kinds of people have to give charity. From there, we went to the Mishnah. Is Akka really the northern border? Contradiction between our Mishnah and the Mishnah all out. Resolution. And then we had um, this contradiction between two bright tote about someone who brings a get on a boat, writes the get on the boat. Is it considered like Israel? Is it considered outside of Israel? And then we said either it's a makhluk at the rabbis and Rabbi Yehuda, or maybe you could explain it's a difference in the reality and both are actually according to Rabbi Yehuda. And then we tried to bring this makhluk, this issue of a natsitz, a plant with a hole in the planter that's up though on stilts. Is that the same makhluk as Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis? First we suggested it is, then we begin to reject it. 
That's it for today. Wishing everybody a great day.